Okay, uh, so welcome to July's bi-monthly webinar. Um, here are the contents that we will be covering today. So first, the staff professional development grants that you submitted and that were approved during 1819. You have to submit invoices in order to get the funds. Um, Christine and Anna are reviewing and processing the ones that have been submitted. So far, the following agencies have submitted invoices which have been processed and approved by our office. Uh, Penn State, New World Association, Literacy Pittsburgh, Pathways, Marywood University, and Somerset Career and Tech Center. So uh, if you are on this call, um, from our perspective, you have done what you need to do. Um, if something happens further along the approval line, Anna will reach out to you and let you know. Um, there are two other agencies who submitted invoices but who need to uh, make corrections to those and resubmit them. And there are 25 agencies who have not yet submitted their invoices. You will not get money if you do not submit an invoice. Please submit the invoice by July 31st. Make sure it is correct. Information on the address to which to submit the invoice is in Appendix C of your grant. Um, information, uh, according to Anna, here are some key items to check before submitting the invoice to make sure it's correct and to speed up the review, approval, and payment process. Make sure the address on the invoice matches exactly what is registered with your agency's vendor number. If there is a difference, it will be returned to you. Also, make sure the date of services on the invoice is within the contract dates of September 1st, 2018 to June 30th, 2019. If the date of services falls outside of that, uh, the, grant, the invoice will be rejected. Um, as a reminder, if you are joining, please make sure you are muted. I'm pretty sure that um, the system, the webinar, automatically mutes you, but if you have called in on a phone, you will need to mute yourself. Thank you. Um, the 2019-20 Family Literacy Kickoff, Adult Education Kickoff, and Data Institute are three weeks away. All programs must attend the Data Institute and the relevant kickoffs. Programs must send a team of at least two people to the Data Institute, and that team must consist of the program administrator and the data quality specialist. Additional staff may attend. Um, after receiving some questions from programs and discussing with advisors, I have decided that program administrators can send a representative to the kickoff if they are unable to attend themselves. However, you as the administrator are still ultimately responsible for your agency's compliance with what is covered in the institute and the kickoff. So regarding registration for the Data Institute and the kickoffs, uh, please make sure you and your staff register for them in the Google Docs link that I sent to you uh, earlier, I guess it was last month. Um, also, if you believe you have already registered, if you could go to the link and double check that everyone who you want to attend has registered separately and that you are in fact registered for the correct kickoff and that you are registered for the Data Institute. Okay, um, I'm hearing some background noise, which means someone is not muted. Please mute your phones. Um, for family literacy programs, um, the end of the year school report. Um, E-data has finally been updated to allow family literacy programs to enter all of the information that is collected on the end of year school report into E-data. 
eData will be shut down for about 30 minutes today at 10.30 to move those changes into the eData site. Um, at that point, you will be able to, family literacy programs, you will be able to enter the uh, end of school year report data from the forms. Please do so by the July 31st deadline. Um, reminder that you will keep uh, whatever documentation you have from the end of year school reports at your local agency. Do not send them to Penn State University as you have in the past. So you'll just keep those locally for your own records. Um, as a reminder, all other data from family literacy, adult basic education, tutoring, and the IELCE grants should have been entered in eData by this morning. That is your two weeks from the uh, time the data were collected. June 30th was the last day you could have collected data, which was a Sunday, so you probably were not. So uh, all your data should be entered as of this morning. For family literacy programs, uh, you will continue to work on the parent education and ILA activities, the NCFL professional development. Uh, in 2019-20. From visits to family literacy programs, it is clear that family literacy staff did not, for the most part, use the NCFL lessons as required. For 1920, uh, programs must use any and all NCFL lesson plans that they did not use in 1819. Furthermore, we strongly encourage programs to reuse those NCFL lessons that they did use in the last program year. There are multiple reasons to do so. As educators, we know that we can always improve our instruction by reflecting on previous lessons, identifying what went well and what didn't, and then changing things up to make the lesson more meaningful and effective. Also, your program should have new families, and in returning families, the parents have gained skills which will allow them to participate in the activities in new ways, and their children are full al further along in the developmental stages. It is important to show parents how they can use the same book and the same activities many times in different ways to support different developmental stages and skills. Um, in addition to using the NCFL lesson plans, programs may create their own parenting, parent education and ILA activities. Those activities must use the NCFL lesson plan template and must include all of the information on the template. Programs must ma maintain copies of all of these lesson plans for review. Um, 1819 final expenditure reports are open. Please work with the person in your fiscal office who completes the FERs. The information we require you to provide is necessary for fiscal and program monitoring and for federal financial and statistical reporting. It is important that the information you provide to us is accurate. New in the FERs for 2018-19, in the federal 064 and the 061 grants, local match will now be entered in a separate section rather than as entries in each of the budget sections. Also, you must indicate if the local match is third party in kind or cash. This is a new reporting requirement for our federal financial report, which is why we are requesting it from you. Uh, for staff-related local match, please list each staff member separately, uh, and in the description include the staff member's name and either the number of hours or the percentage of time that is used to calculate the match. Um, under uh, also new is a counties served section. Uh, that is in the federal 064, state 064, optional tutoring program, and 061 grants. Um, those, um, this is new, um, and that section you have to put the budgeted amount from the original grant 
and then the actual amount that you expended in each one of the counties that your program served. Uh, if there are changes between budgeted and uh, expended, please provide a comment explaining those changes in the message board at the bottom of the page. Every year we see very similar errors. Uh, here are some reminders about how to accurately complete the FERs. First, in section part two, final report details, total receipts must match what is in FAI to the penny. Make sure your agency has received all of its 2018-19 payments before completing this section. The total expenditures in part two must match to the penny the total in the budget summary. If we return an FER for corrections, you should always double check the corrected budget summary at total and update the expended amount in the part two final report details section if necessary. Most of the budget sections in the FERs require a description for each item entered. The description must be detailed enough that it is clear exactly what the funds were used for. We know what the general category is from the object code, so simply restating the name of the object code, for example, texts or rent or other supplies, isn't acceptable in the description section. You must precisely list what was purchased. We often have to return FERs because FICA exceeds the maximum allowable amount. Total FICA entered in the FER must be within $1 of the maximum allowable based on total salaries charged to the grant. Rounding each FICA entry often causes programs to exceed that amount. Again, double check the math before submitting the FERs. And yes, we do the calculations here when reviewing the FERs. As you know, programs are required to use a portion of their administrative funds from federal grants to contribute to the costs of the PA career links in which they are partners. Those contributions are entered under contracted services in object code 390 in the federal 064 and 061 grants and FERs. If your agency uses local funds, uh, in other words, you use non-division of adult education funds to pay for the PA career link infrastructure costs, please enter a comment in the message board at the bottom of the page explaining that. For agencies that have subgrantees, if a subgrantee uses a portion of its funds to pay for the PA career link infrastructure costs, those payments should be entered separately, but still in the object code 390. Programs must provide a detailed justification for all equipment purchases by adding one or more comments in the message board at the bottom of the purchased equipment section. Both the agency activity summary and the county's served sections in the FERs include both a budgeted amount column and an expended amount column or expenditures column. They have slightly different names. The budgeted amount comes from the grant you submitted for the year. You will need to go back to that grant to get the correct number. The system does not autofill it. The expended amount is what the program actually spent. Your agency needs to have a process in place to calculate the actual expenditures by the categories given. Unless your agency has considerable local funds to support your program and supplement the adult basic education funding you receive from our office, it is highly unlikely that the amount you budgeted and the amount you expended matched exactly. Um, so you need to take time to figure out, you know, how much did you actually expend on ABE institutional if you had corrections instruction. How much did you actually spend on ABE instruction, which includes ESL, um, versus what you budgeted? These numbers are important because the amounts that you enter in the agency activity summary are used in our federal financial report to show the feds and Congress how much money is being spent 
on various levels of students. So it is important that you work with your fiscal staff to correctly calculate those numbers. All three of the final expenditure report sections listed on this slide are required for Pennsylvania's federal financial reporting or statistical reporting. Therefore, it is important that all programs report this information as accurately as possible. We have provided detailed instructions in the help buttons for each of these sections to support you and your fiscal staff to accurately calculate the required amounts. If you have any questions while you are completing these sections, please contact your advisor. For infrastructure costs, remember that these are non-personnel costs only. If your local board charges you a lump sum for all PA CareerLink costs together, you will need to ask them to break out the amounts charged to you by infrastructure costs and shared personnel costs. In this section, in the FER, only report the infrastructure costs. Agencies that hold classes at a PA Career Lake site and pay additional rent for that space should include those costs in the amount reported in this infrastructure cost section. So in this section, you will select yes if your program used funds from that grant to contribute to the infrastructure costs for the PA Career Link sites. You need to list the PA Career Link sites in the appropriate place. Also, do not include the cost of any of your program staff working at the PA Career Link. Again, that, and that's not shared personnel costs, those are just your staffing costs, but those do not get included in the infrastructure costs section. In the federal financial report, we are required to report the amount of federal funds used to pay for the occupational training portion of an IET. If your agency has a division approved IET and you use division funds to cover some or all of the costs associated with the occupational training component of the IET, you must complete all parts of this section. Do not include costs associated with the adult education or workforce preparation components of the IET. Remember that the use of Title II funds to pay for occupational training is only allowed within an IET. The division requires that all IETs be approved by office staff before the program can offer it. Therefore, if your agency has used division grant funds to pay for occupational training, outside of a division approved IET, that is an unallowable expense and you will need to find local funds to repay those costs. Um, so for this section in the FER, select yes only if your program used funds from, this grant, from the grant to pay for some or all of the occupational training portion of the IET. And you are only reporting the use of funds from the grant. If the occupational training costs were paid by another funding source, uh, don't report those costs. Um, finally, you must report the amount of federal grant funds you pro your program used for the five career services allowed under Title II. All students in your program receive com some career services because intake orientation and initial assessment are all career services. The help button in the career services section includes information, sorry, lost my place, includes information on what to include and what to exclude when calculating expenditures on career services. And I will review those in just a minute. Uh, please, please, please <laughs> review the information in the help button with your fiscal staff when you are completing the FERs. So, um, as some guidance, and this is the wording from the help button, is when calculating the amount of the grant expended on these career services, exclude all costs associated with grant administration, data entry, and instruction. 
That does not mean that you would exclude all costs in function code 1691 and function code 2900, however. For example, one of the career services is outreach, intake, and orientation which would include outreach costs reported in 2900, as well as the cost of intake and orientation, which you report in 1691. Only include costs associated with initial assessment of the students, also called pre-testing. Do not include costs associated with post-testing. A portion of case management and student support service costs will be included in this section specifically those associated with providing information and referrals to support, to support services to help students attend class and costs associated with transition services such as referring students to other WIOA core programs and giving students information about providers of education, training, and other workforce services. Um, in general, be conservative when determining these costs. So um, that is it for FERs. Um, we will have time for questions at the end of the webinar, OK? Um, so this is just, these are several slides um, kind of as a heads up for something that is coming. Um, WIOA includes a requirement for assessments and evaluation of funded activities. Um, the U.S. Department of Education, um, which is OCTE and IES, the Institute for Educational Sciences, um, has contracted with uh, the American Institutes for Research, AIR, to conduct a national study of the implementation of adult education. Um, this study is going to describe how providers are implementing adult education and what challenges they're experiencing um, and will involve surveys. As directed by OCTE, I have provided AIR with contact information for all of our direct grantees. AIR will be contacting you with more information early fall and then we'll send the surveys to you in mid-October. We expect you to respond to the survey, taking your time to provide complete and accurate information. And these next slides are kind of in there to give you a little bit more information about what is happening with the, the study. You know, they're basically looking at how things are being implemented if things have changed since before WIOA and the challenges that state and local providers are experiencing. Hi, um, I'm hearing some talking, so please put yourself on mute. Um, there are a variety of data that uh, AIR will be using, the survey that you will be completing, uh, they are going to survey all of the state directors. There will be some comparisons to a prior adult education provider survey conducted in 2003, NRS data, and American Community Survey. And um, these links are included in the uh, PDF of the slides that I sent you, so if you would like more information, you're welcome to, to go there and look at it. And uh, some now some information related to WIOA planning. Uh, tomorrow, L&I is holding a webinar on regional and local planning. Um, the target audience is the local boards, but you are welcome to join the webinar. Uh, you're not required to participate, but it may be helpful to you to hear the guidance that is being given to the local boards that you work with. Uh, I forward did the hold the date notice to you. I have not yet received the actual link, um, and I will forward that once I get it. Um, I will say that uh, it's possible that I will not get it until tomorrow, 
and I am out of the office tomorrow. I will try to keep an eye on my emails and I'll forward it to Anna and have Anna send it out to you. So if it is something you're interested in um, participating in, um, look for an email either from me or from Anna with the link. Also in support of the development of the next WIOA state plan, which is due next March, the PA Workforce Development Board is hosting a series of listening sessions across the state. Um, the dates and locations are listed. All of them will be starting at 8.30 with registration and the actual session starts at 9. Um, I emailed information about the sessions to the program contacts last week. The flyer that I sent included the an incorrect address for the Central Pennsylvania Institute of Science and Technology up in the State College area. This slide has the correct address. If you are interested in attending one of the sessions, please RSVP to the email listed on the slide by July 19th. And uh, they are requesting that when you RSVP that you include the names of all the individuals who will attend as well as uh, name the session date and location. And final, uh, finally, a couple of items you should be aware of. Um, some of you may have heard of this, I don't know, um, but as part of the school code that was passed earlier this month, the compulsory school age was changed to 6 to 18. Previously it was 8 to 17. Beginning next school year, so 2021 school year, effective for us July 1st, 2020, um, the compulsory school age will be 6 to 18. Um, it will, so because it's not until next year, it will not affect eligibility to participate in our programming this program year, but we do need to prepare for next year. Um, you know, the eligibility for uh, federal funds is 16 or compulsory school age. And um, for state, it's 17 and in both cases, it's not enrolled in school. Um, so because the compulsory school age is changing next year, we're going to have to pay a little bit more attention to those 17-year-olds and ensure that they are, are not enrolled in school and are not required to be enrolled in school. Um, so that's just something to keep in the back of your mind for next year. For 19-20 uh, school year, we are still fine with the current eligibility uh, requirements. Some of you have asked me about the SNAP 5050 program, which is an employment and training program for SNAP recipients managed in Pennsylvania by the Department of Human Services. In SNAP 5050, nonprofit organizations leverage local funding against funding from the federal government to provide job specific skills training. DHS, Department of Human Services here in Pennsylvania is looking for new partners for its SNAP 5050 program. If you are interested, please contract, uh, contact Andrew Prehar uh, for more information. His email address is included on the slide. Please note that Division of Adult Education fun grant funds cannot be used as the cost sharing for SNAP 5050. Um, the only funds that can be used are funds that are not federal funds and uh, state funds that are not already being used as part of cost sharing. And your state adult education and family literacy grants are used by PDE, this office for our cost sharing for federal funds. Um, so if you are interested in SNAP 5050, you are going to have to have some kind of source of other funds that are not being used as cost sharing local match for any other federal funds. Um, if you have any other questions about SNAP 5050, please contact Andrew. Uh, the advisors and I will not be able to, to answer those questions um, confidently. <laughs> 
And um, so if there are any questions, you may, I believe, go ahead and uh, unmute yourselves, or you can type in the text box. Amanda? Yes? Uh, it's Kim Topper. Uh -huh. uh, when will the webinar be available to view from this presentation? Um, I'm not really sure. It's usually a couple of days. Okay. I just want to make sure my fiscal people see this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, um, I'm hoping to have it done within a, within a couple of days. Um, I'm hearing from Lisa Bailey, who takes care of these things. She said probably Thursday or Friday. Amanda, this is Kelly Davis. Uh -huh. um, back to the career services um, on the FERs. Is that for only federal funds that we report that, or is that state funding also? No, that is only federal funds. That okay, section is yeah. That section is only in the federal FE, uh, federal 064 um, FER, and then for the EL Civics program within theirs. Thank you for asking and letting me clarify that. Thank you. Yeah. So for um, for the for this particular slide, infrastructure costs you are allowed to use state funds to cover some of the PA CareerLink rental costs if necessary. Um, you cannot use state funds in lieu of federal funds, but you can use them in addition to. So we do have uh, an infrastructure cost section in the state, um, in the Family Literacy Grant, and as well as in the state 064 grants. Um, for most of you, you, that will be no, that you didn't use any of the grant funds, which is fine. Um, but some of you do use some state funds. Uh, the infrastructure costs is also obviously in the federal 064 and IELCE. The IET training costs and the career services are only in the federal FERs. Um, I have a uh, question. Is there a PDE specific invoice form for the PD grants with guidelines on completing it? Nope. You can just submit it. You know, you need to um, provide the number of hours that staff worked. You know, I think some of the invoices have included, you know, the dates and the staff members um, and the number of hours. But um, Anna, do you have any guidance on what the invoice looks like? Just make sure it includes an address and um, a remit to address and that it's matching. And um, you can include hours, um, staff, date of service, um, any other descriptions that you have for what for the work you provided. Okay. Um, Christine is the one who's um, reviewing the invoice initially because she's the PD coordinator and she's the one who reviewed your initial emails uh, requesting the funds. She's out of the office for a couple of days, uh, but if you do have questions on exactly the type of information she's looking for, you can email her, chauk at pa.gov, and she'll get back to you when she's back in the office. Um, I have another question for local match reporting. Does staff include volunteer classroom aides and other volunteers? Um, you, for the volunteer classroom aides and uh, other volunteers, you can lump them together, um, but I would still like to know the total number of hours um, that you're reporting, but you don't necessarily have to report each individual tutor or volunteer classroom aid. Um, that should obviously be documented in eData, so that shouldn't be too hard to calculate total.
Are there any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you very much for your time. As always, um, if you have questions, please contact your advisors. They are happy to help you. Um, I will stop recording now. Thank you.